Good afternoon and welcome to the first webinar organized by the College of Europe on EU-China making room for a rising global trade power, which is part of the Executive Education Program on Trade Policy and the TTIP. My name is Jesus Ballesteros and I am the Director of the Development Office of the College of Europe, the department responsible for this initiative. But before we start with our webinar, please allow me to give you a few words about the College of Europe. With more than 60 years of experience, the College is the first university institute pro providing postgraduate studies on European affairs. Created at the instances of personalities such as Salvador de Madriaga or Winston Churchill, who believed that it was needed to create a place where graduate students from all over Europe would not only study but live together, where we can consider as the origin of the European integration process. Our first campus was established in 1949 here in Bruges, and the second one in Natalin, Warsaw, Poland, in 1994. We provide master's programs at the level of Master of Masters, LLM, four of them in our campus in Bruges, and the fifth one in Natalin. The masters are Master of Arts in European Economic Studies, European Law, LLM, European Political and Administrative Studies, EU International Relations and Diplomacy Studies, and finally Master of Arts in European Interdisciplinary Studies in Natalin. But the mission of the college doesn't stop here. It goes beyond. With the aim of communicating Europe, the college, through its development office, provides as well other sorts of services, such as executive education programs, participate in the implementation of EU and non-EU projects and academic cooperation activities. The Development Office was established in 1996, and this year we are celebrating our 20th anniversary. For this reason, we have decided to enlarge our offer of executive education courses, and in some cases, add new topics to courses already existing. That is the case of the Trade Policy course, where we have added a whole new day on the TTIP agreement. While in other cases, we have created brand new courses on topics such as monitoring and evaluation of EU projects, economic governance, or migration management, which will take place this fall. This being said, I think it is time now to introduce our speaker, Professor Pierre Defrenio. Professor Defrenio was a European civil servant from 1970 to 2005, when he retired as Deputy Director General in DigiTrade after having been head of cabinet for Pascal Lamy, European Commissioner for Trade. Pre previously, he was director for North-South Relations and head of cabinet for Etienne d'Avignon, vice president of the European Commission. Professor De Freigny is currently the director of the College of Euro Madariaga Center and was previously, since 2008, the executive director of the Madariaga College of Euro Foundation. He was recently decorated by King Philip of Belgium with the title of Commandeur dans l'Ordre de la Couronne. Pierre de Freigny is an expert in and regularly publishes on EU-China relations, Eurozone governance, and macroeconomic issues. Now, before starting, I think it is very important that we inform you about certain guidelines and instructions to obtain the best possible result. For that, I will give the floor to my colleague, Catherine Michinelli, and we will start the webinar immediately after. Thank you, Jesus. My name is Catherine Michinelli, and I'm a project manager at the Development Office of the College of Europe. I, um, I'm the manager of the trade policy and, and the TTIP executive education course on offer this autumn, and I will outline the program later uh, at the end of the webinar. Now instead, I will leave the floor to Professor Defren, who for 45 minutes will, um, will speak on EU-China making room for a rising global trade power, and I encourage you uh, kindly to uh, send your questions within these 45 minutes. You can send questions using the questions box below the screen in front of you. We will be tracking these questions throughout these 45 minutes, and we will then ask them to Professor Defresne at the end of his 45-minute lecture. Um, at the end of the webinar, uh, it will be back to me, um, and uh, I will uh, present the course to you. So we look forward to receiving your questions and strongly encourage you to send them throughout the 45-minute uh, presentation of Professor Defren. Professor Defren, now the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Catherine. Good afternoon. Uh, today is an important day for the EU since uh, President Juncker this morning delivered a very much uh, expected uh, State of the Union speech. And now you're lucky to have to listen to a lesson on EU-China relations. And there is a common denominator between the two speeches. They all carry a very high ambition for Europe. Having said that, we're going to talk about a relationship which is crucial for the world prosperity and peace, that is, the relationship between a rising global power, China, and an ancient established global power, uh, Europe. And before actually uh, addressing the heart of the topic, I'd like to make uh, two uh, preliminary remarks. One is the question of uh, the Czech and the egg uh, process between growth and trade. What is the main uh, cause? Is it trade or is it uh, growth? And the question becomes uh, very relevant today because the world is witnessing a slowdown in world growth. And for the first time over the last 20 years, international trade is uh, proceeding at a slower rate than uh, the uh, world economy growth. And the question, therefore, is do we uh, stir up growth uh, through domestic policies, or do we rely on trade liberalization for triggering a new bout of world growth. This question is very central and it's not an easy uh, question to answer because I would say, as far as I'm concerned, that I see the origin of growth mainly in productivity gains, whereas I see trade as a vehicle to disseminate trade growth across the world. Uh, the G20, precisely chaired by China uh, in Hangzhou, on the 4th and 5th uh, September, precisely made a point that uh, the world should now concentrate on domestic policies, on domestic reforms. And that would be the crux of the uh, new world strategy, both looking at uh, supply side factors and also for the first time demand side factors. So uh, trade liberalization remain on the agenda, but perhaps is not uh, going through the same momentum as it uh, was the case over the last decades. The second remark is about the change of scale the globalization has been bringing about in the world. Change of scales with regard to states, a series of continental states have emerged, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, Nigeria, and more and more matter in economic terms because of uh, the convergence that has taken place uh, thanks to globalization. A change of scales in the business. Global oligopolistic firms play now a role which sometimes uh, is more important than the role of the states. Just think of uh, Bill Gates addressing the COP21 last December in Paris. And last but not least, the scale of threats and opportunities has changed, uh, be it uh, the climate uh, thing, then uh, the terrorism, the uh, multiplication of regional 
or local conflicts, the risk of pandemics, the cyber war, all these new risks can only be managed at world level and therefore call for strong and large uh, actors. And here I see a role for Europe which should substitute for its member states who in the future won't have the strength to uh, interact with those large continental states, those big global firms and with the uh, challenges ahead. Now let's come to our uh, topic of the day. I'll try to remind you that trade is a complex thing. Uh, it's important to bear that in mind, do away with simplistic views. Globalization uh, is a new paradigm for international economic relations. The peaceful rise of China is really the main challenge of globalization. And Europe has a role to play in ensuring that that rise of China remains peaceful. And then we'll look into the EU-China trade uh, relations, but we'll extend that to a more global approach before uh, concluding. A word about trade. Obviously, uh, international trade is a source of economic progress and welfare. Trading with other countries provide a wider variety of goods, services and processes through the dissemination of technology and, above all, cheaper goods and services. There are three main families of obstacles to trade. One is, of course, distance. And distance has uh, been uh, shrinking uh, thanks to the formidable uh, moves in high tech uh, bit in the uh, information technology or with the containership in such a way that today distance has uh, not uh, re remained an obstacle, a serious obstacle to trade. The second obstacle is the political obstacle created when there is a frontier. It's about tariffs and quota, but it's more and more about regulations and norms. And here, to get rid of those obstacles, negotiation is the only possibility, and this is uh, mainly the focus of uh, our reflection here. And last but not least, there is a family of obstacles which is often forgotten and yet gains uh, in relevance today, which is the barriers to entry on some national markets put by the private sector themselves through oligopolistic and monopolistic practices which call for competition policy, not only at national but even at global level, being understood that the most effective competition policy remain uh, trade liberalization. The rationale for free trade is strong, obviously. Uh, trade liberalization allows to exploit the comparative advantages of countries, be it technology, natural resources, endowment, human resources, economies of scale, and brands. And here we, I think, hopefully have internalized the lesson taught by Ricardo when uh, he explained that uh, and demonstrated that even if a country is more competitive in any product or services, and even if another is less competitive in all products and services, they both share an interest to trade provided relative prices are different. That's the key condition for making trade relevant and it's practically always fulfilled. So trade liberalization has a very strong economic rationale for it. Now, something which we forget about is the basic condition imposed by the economists to make free trade as 
efficient and is possible in delivering uh, productivity and growth. Uh, the first condition is the mobility of factors within the country. That is the possibility for labor and capital to move around from one sector to another so as to make adjustment to the new competition conditions possible. The second is the level of transportation costs, which, as I said, is now uh, it's not anymore a problem today, but for its impact on climate, which cannot be ignored anymore. And then, more subtly, subtly but more importantly, is the question of the degree of competition ranging before, from perfect to imperfect, uh, which prevail on the markets after the opening. And uh, if perfect competition is there, the benefits are uh, high. If uh, oligopolistic firms from foreign countries take a wide share of the market, then they can capture a large part of the benefits of liberalization and lose, therefore, in uh, economic efficiency for the economy at large. Uh, fourth condition is the level of employment of the resources. And we going through uh, high unemployment today, uh, which is, I think, not an objection to further liberalize, but a serious complication, a political complication, and make the case of uh, free trade less uh, obvious. Uh, by the way, uh, we should simply bear in mind that trade does not only carry benefit, but it also generates costs and we face a problem of uh, winners and losers, not just win-win games, but far more complex situation. And in fact, any economic policy measure, starting with trade, should be looked at through uh, three lenses, and I refer here to the classical Musgrave uh, distinction between the different uh, functions of uh, economic policy. First, there is the efficiency of in the allocation of resources, where trade plays a key role in its transformative function, particularly through technology. Then you have the stabilization of the economy, that is the uh, balance between uh, uh, employment and inflation, which in the case of the European Union uh, is uh, shared between member states and uh, uh, EU. And last but not least, there is the equity factor, because uh, equity is affected by trade. Some are winners and others are losers. And the question is the redistribution of the burden of trade liberalization between different groups. And that calls for instruments, that calls for policies, and again here, the EU is absent. Uh, member states are supposed to carry this uh, task. And uh, I would tentatively say that uh, in Brussels, too often, uh, one focuses mainly on the benefits of trade, overlooking the fact that uh, there are costs and those costs are borne essentially by member states, by local territory, and the EU doesn't have yet, despite a small globalization fund, an instrument to ensure some solidarity between uh, member states and between social categories, and therefore, uh, Brussels then tend to ignore the political tensions that uh, today uh, are uh, encouraging Euroscepticism and uh, populism in Europe. 
The truth is that we are going through a phase of growing discontent with further trade liberalization uh, in Europe. And I believe three factors are here very important. One is the oligopolistic structure of competition in the key sectors uh, where EU is, uh, mm, is going through uh, technological gap, uh, certainly vis-a-vis uh, the US, but more and more vis-a-vis -vis China. And therefore, uh, the EU technological gap is uh, actually representing a very severe constraint for further liberalization since uh, despite the progress of the single market, which is still far from being completed, the uh, EU industry and services has not reached yet a level of competitiveness which would make sure that the benefits would be real and fairly distributed. The second uh, difficulty is the high level of unemployment, uh, which of course is mainly a macroeconomic uh, phenomenon, especially in the Eurozone, where the poor governance uh, prevents uh, to give uh, the normal rate of growth expected from this uh, Eurozone, but it generates a general hostility against any uh, further trade liberalization measure. And last but not least is the question of growing inequalities, uh, which is uh, aggravating that uh, sense of precariousness and fear among the people and therefore this time is not a good time for trade liberalization. Moreover, I would say for uh, the least competitive countries of the Eurozone, the one size fits all exchange rate complicates matter for some member states. Having said that, we might just uh, say a few words about globalization as the new paradigm, a new context for international trade. Globalization, uh, I think, uh, is uh, a very complex uh, development, a major one, which changes actually the economic and geopolitical balance of the world as well as the feasibility of going on with our present model taking into consideration the constraints on uh, the uh, environment and, uh, and the climate. First, let's give a definition of globalization. Globalization uh, consists in the implementation by the large multinational of the so-called global production or global value chain, GVC, uh, which means basically that uh, big firms, instead of producing somewhere and delivering elsewhere, but producing in several locations in the world, would now segment the global value chain in such a way they would disseminate those segments across the world so as to capture all specific comparative advantages and therefore increasing the productivity and the efficiency in the allocation of resources worldwide. So this is a great accomplishment allowed by two sets of uh, factors. One is uh, technological innovation and managerial innovation linked to the cost uh, of uh, low, lowering cost of uh, ITs and uh, container ships. The other factor is the trade and investment liberalization. So market decision and policy decision explains globalization and make global firms the key actors of globalization. And this is witnessed by the fact that trade now turns an intra-firm trade and is more and more mainly about components and services. The, uh, the impact of the global value chain on uh, 
the convergence between advanced and developing countries stems from the fact that because those segments now can land in a country with a low level of industrialization, it spreads the benefit of industrialization more widely, the threshold of access to industrial activity having been lowered by the segmentation. So this is a, a genuine benefit of globalization, but of course with the possibility for big firms to determine where they will make the investment, taking into consideration the labor costs, the taxes and of course the environmental norms with the risk of a uh, risk to the bottom among competing countries for attracting uh, foreign direct uh, investment. Uh, the globalization uh, has uh, made things for better with regard to the global allocation of resources, I just mentioned that, but also because it uh, brought about an unprecedented and frankly unexpected partial but effective market-driven north-south convergence. So north-south convergence is taking place not as much as we thought, as a result of uh, development aid or uh, as a result of trade preferences, but thanks to the profit-driven actions of big companies disseminating production chain across the world. It's an uh, interesting uh, observation to make. Now, it's not only for better, it's also for worse. Worse being a rising arbitrage power of large firms over government and territories. A pressure on natural resources and climate, which is brought about by economic convergence. You know, large populations have always been there for the last uh, century, 20% of the world population has captured 80% of the wealth. And conversely, 80% of the population had to do just with 20% of the wealth. But what, is, uh, what has changed is now through the convergence, that is the uh, increasing level of development of standards of living among the poor country, the demand and the activity rise and now put a pressure on the environment which is a new phenomenon and which has had over one generation uh, structural and sometimes irreversible consequences and the first, because of its sheer size, in influencing the sustainability of the present uh, growth model at world level is, of course, China. Now, third, I think, uh, problem raised by uh, globalization is the growing inequalities among regions and among social groups within countries. That is, you have countries that have been left over by globalization, and it's partly the case of Africa, and even, I would say, to a large extent, Latin America. Some people say uh, Latin America and is part of the BRICS train, uh, which uh, has been pulled by the Chinese locomotive, and they are emerging as uh, advanced nations. Well, it was possible to think along those lines until uh, the collapse of the oil and then the raw material price. Today we see that countries that were considered on the way 
towards development are backed into the difficulty, probably because not enough effort has been made by their government to invest in human resources and make uh, development uh, take off uh, instead of uh, keeping the excessive specialization in uh, primary uh, goods and energy. But you have also increasing inequalities within countries, and it's true everywhere. It's true in China, it's true in Brazil, it's true in America. It is becoming to be true in Europe, despite the very robust system of transfers Europe has put into place over the last century. And this uh, growing uh, concern for inequalities uh, is particularly affecting the middle class, which sees its uh, status uh, put at risk by uh, globalization. And this originates, again, disenchantment and uh, uh, populist uh, reactions. And this, I believe, is something we have to bear in mind as Europeans because, unfortunately, that feeling, that fear of downgrading of the middle class takes uh, Europe as the scapegoat for this uh, evolution, partly through the trade liberalization initiative uh, taken by uh, the EU. Uh, inequality is, is an extremely complex uh, phenomenon which uh, has uh, above all technological uh, reasons, also societal reasons, for example the stability of family, but also clearly there is an impact of true globalization when you put in competition labor markets from the West and from uh, emerging economies such as China against China as the most important. And this is precisely the main product of uh, globalization is China. China is a giant. It's a very ancient and very different civilization. Actually, it's the only civilization that has not been exposed to uh, European Western influence over its 5,000 years history. And China has been for the last half century a reunited and independent China. But contrary to what we thought was not uh, at sleep at all, uh, even during the Mao years, there has been in China not only a political unification, but massive investment in uh, infrastructure, education, health, and primary transformation. So, in a way, uh, conditions were met uh, to make a real <laughs> a great leap uh, forward, not Mao's great leap, but uh, the Deng Xiaoping move in uh, December 78 when the Communist Party decided to explore a path towards drastic reforms in order precisely to take advantage of the nascent uh, globalization. And the Chinese proceeded in their way, which is always uh, a long-term vision with uh, strategic planning and very experimental, very pragmatic approach. They used to cross the river by groping the stones. Pragmatism uh, in the use of instruments, uh, remember the cat allegory by Deng Xiaoping, doesn't matter whether a cat is black or white, provided it catches the mouth. Uh, and the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, whether we like it or not, played a key role in uh, mobilizing forces to make China respond to the opportunity of uh, globalization, which uh, 
probably uh, can be dated back to the Reagan and uh, Thatcher years, which coincide also with the IT revolutions, and uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, neoliberalism uh, imposed by Thatcher and Reagan, and uh, the uh, uh, revolution in uh, the third revolution, but the peaceful one in China, has uh, marked the beginning of globalization. And in a way, globalization is the product of a strange marriage between Western capitalism and communist China, who have made globalization a success. Because I remind you, my humble opinion, the BRICS uh, case uh, depends uh, mainly on uh, China's, uh, on the Chinese miracle. Now, a word about China itself, precisely, where in uh, the very heart of the discussion, and I would just like to make two observations using graphs. Uh, one is the formidable rate of growth of China over the last uh, three decades. It's not unprecedented, by the way. Some countries have done almost as well. I'm thinking of South Korea. But no country has done that on such a large scale. So what makes the Chinese miracle a real exception is the combination of size and speed and its direct impact on lowering the level of poverty by pulling hundreds of millions of people out of extreme poverty. The second thing is that a country which was uh, uh, representing 1% of the world GDP 50 years ago is now among the largest economy in the world. On these graphs, uh, the European Union is in red and is still outranking America and China to the left. But, but uh, China has uh, completed uh, this uh, catching up over uh, one generation, which is, of course, important, whereas EU uh, has a high figure because it's an aggregate of national uh, GDP. So now, some people say China is already in PPP terms, uh, the, the largest market in the world, certainly of the same level as the US, but with a formidable virtual potential for growth that is still uh, with annual rate of growth of uh, 7% today. Now we have to be aware about newcomers entering in the system. We have made a terrible mistake with Germany before World War I by not allowing Germany to join the uh, club of the rich nation. And in that way, uh, I think the status quo uh, states, America, German, uh, France, uh, UK, Belgium, and so on, have a responsibility in the failure of integrating Germany in the club of advanced nation. We made the same mistake with Japan when all of a sudden the American Congress decided to raise tariffs and stop brutally uh, Japanese exports towards uh, a America, which was a main factor in uh, encouraging uh, the military uh, groups in Japan to take uh, the leadership and to uh, push uh, Japan into a war to build up a so-called uh, co-prosperity sphere with its uh, supplier of raw material and food. Now, what about China? China is far bigger in relative terms than 
Germany, uh, one uh, half century ago, or uh, today, uh, more recently, Japan. Uh, not only is China bigger, uh, but it goes faster, its impact on uh, trade uh, is uh, enormous, but yet more on uh, climate, and therefore its uh, economic rise becomes a challenge for the world. Uh, and uh, it's also a challenge for American hegemony, so the peaceful rise of China will depend on China, but also on the West, how it will integrate China. China should be perceived as an hybrid system, combining a Leninist party, the Chinese Communist Party, with centralization and exclusivity and monopoly of power, and capitalism, capitalism in a very mixed way, combining uh, state-owned uh, company, uh, private sector, in China, but also a critical number of affiliates of multinationals, which, by the way, are key in the export strategy of China, since they export about half of the goods exports towards the rest of the world. China's entry in the world economy has uh, been first through the back door of the poorhouse, thanks to cheap labor and uh, financial repression, uh, which has uh, ab made China able to build up a huge trade surplus. Buying their ticket of entry into the American market through the MFN clause, by uh, funding part of the fiscal deficit in uh, America uh, since a great deal of the forex, forex stock in, uh, America, in China is made up of uh, T-bonds from America. Uh, today, uh, China has then uh, opted for uh, quite ambivalent path of integration the world economy. On the one hand, it has joined the WTO under very restrictive conditions imposed by the West in 2001. It has gradually liberated its financial flows, although not completely, the capital account is still under control, but now, the uh, yuan has been considered as enough international by the IMF to be part of a basket of currency which is used by the IMF as a, uh, as a special drawing rights, uh, that is uh, multilateral currency, meaning China is both in terms of trade, in terms of finance in terms also of climate. They signed the uh, COPS 21 conclusion treaty uh, just before the Hangzhou summit uh, in the beginning of the month. So China has taken the multilateral road, but at the same time it has taken the regional road by building up a, a financial system with the Chiang Mai initiative they launch uh, the International Investment uh, Bank for uh, Asia. They, not only for Asia, by the way, they also uh, initiated the One Belt, One Road uh, initiative. So China is hesitating between the two uh, roads to follow, and it's uh, partly it's. Uh, final choice will be determined by our own uh, attitude. Let's say that China is on the way since the 13th uh, five-year plan to move from uh, export FDI-led economy into an economy more focused on domestic demands, on services, and above all on the 
climbing up of uh, technology. So we s witness today a change, a drastic change through very uh, demanding reforms of the Chinese model from an uh, export-led into an uh, internal market-led uh, economy with a lot, of course, of uh, possibilities for the trade partner and less pressure from China. China is of course taking advantage of its uh, fast economic growth to uh, go into uh, military catching up uh, and this is part of the Chinese challenge for the rest of the world. So China uh, is today changing the geopolitical conditions with the reaction from America where you have two current of uh, thinking. One is the containment of China uh, and the other is rather the engagement with China. I would say the first is neoconservative uh, and the pincer strategy combining TTP, TPP and TTIP leaving China outside is part of that drive where us a uh, man like Paulson uh, has pushed forward uh, the idea of a strategic economic dialogue. Now, what about Europe? Europe is engaging with China, but the f first, uh, I think, uh, outstanding evolution we can witness is the fact that Europe uh, and China had been for a long time until the turn of the century towards a status of global power on parallel track. Now uh, China is going on, remains a success story, while the EU has been uh, through a difficult phase, I would say the EU's progress has come to a halt. Uh, with the poor performance of the Eurozone, the loss of controls of its neighborhoods, the refugee crisis and the impact on the Schengen Agreement, and the uncertainty created by the Brexit. But above all, the rivalry between the two, the three big states uh, in the EU undermines the credibility of the EU when it deals with the real big three, Russia, America, and China, allowing them, especially China, to play the divide and rule tactics. Uh, today, China, EU indeed, which was a major player in the GATT, is going through a series of uh, uh, difficulties. True, Europe remains a major trade bloc. True, EU negotiators are seasoned ones whose expertise remain a major strategic asset for EU. True, the EU exercise an exclusive competence in trade and investment external condition. But uh, EU has uh, not completed its internal market in critical area. It doesn't have a single common currency. The technological gap on the US and China is rising and we still depend on the US for our security. But moreover, the importance is that member states compete fiercely for attracting foreign investment and for uh, competing for exports. Now for all this rising difficulty, Europe and China have developed a strong and dynamic relationship. They are the most important respective trade partners. Uh, cost investment and trade are exploding. The deficit uh, is important but not uh, necessarily an uh, insurmountable obstacle, uh, EU exports are making headways and should be uh, developing uh, more in the future and China is investing more and more in uh, Europe. Now, of course, the 
relationship goes beyond trade. And I will not dwell on the strategic partnership build up between China and Europe. Uh, I will simply insist on what makes the trade uh, agenda a difficult one. There is a positive side, of course, which is the expansion of trade and investment, the fact that we are negotiating a bilateral investment treaty, the prospect of a foreign trade uh, uh, agreement, the fact that uh, bonds in the UN are being emitted in the city in London, but on the conscientious, contentious side, you have the recurrent problem of anti-dumping and anti-subsidy linked to the market economy status. The question of overcapacities in steel, that must be reduced. The uh, implementation of intellectual property rights, the market access for EU investors, which remain distorted and uh, with uh, a series of uh, limitations and exclusions in uh, China. Last, uh, I would say EU is trying to achieve uh, reciprocity in its relation with uh, China. That's its main concern. Its other concern, more on a strategic uh, level, is to push China to engage. And the question is, does the EU itself actually uh, punch uh, above or below its own weight? That is, do we do as we preach? The key problem, and I will conclude on that, is the fact that the world is, might be heading for a re-bipolarization where China and US would be on a collision road if we are not able to build up a new order, a new international order based on rule based multilateralism for a multipolar world. And this basic choice uh, will determine whether the world is on a trend of prosperity and peace or, or a confrontation and perhaps more severe uh, conflagration. So the question is for Europe to play its full-fledged role in the new world which is emerging as a consequence of the rise of China, will Europe be a partner or will it be an onlooker? That's the choice we have to make today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Defren, for um, your very interesting and um, enriching presentation. Uh, the way you outlined, uh, it really explained why China is China today, what, uh, what led to China's growth. And um, I have a question, actually. You spoke about the risks of globalization on Europe uh, and the social risks that it, uh, it led to. What are, in practice, the, the risks that China is facing for its very fast like a growth that happened in a decade? And uh, are they addressing these risks? Well, China is confronting uh, three very severe challenges. Uh, one is, of course, the growing uh, disparities between regions, between the coast and the center of China. The second is the social inequalities that have uh, blown up, and which is a severe problem for a communist country. And. Uh, uh, Last but not least, uh, China uh, remains uh, an economy which has uh, to uh, stabilize its growth by a better uh, control of its financial and monetary policy and through climbing up the technology ladder. Uh, so these are three major concerns for uh, China. And I am not forgetting here the environment uh, challenge since the pollution of air, water, and earth is in some areas of China uh, at a very critical level 
with uh, very strong reactions from the population. So the party, the Communist Party, must absolutely address those three problems. This is, in a nutshell, the main focus of the five tenets of the 13th uh, five-year plans decided uh, two years back uh, under President Xi Jinping uh, chairmanship uh, with the view of uh, promoting innovation, of greening China, of opening up further China, of uh, bridging the regional gaps, and of pushing for the inclusion of the people in the model. So China is taking steps, and actually the depth and the uh, strength of those reforms uh, raise a series of uh, serious opposition, uh, which is partly dealt with through uh, the fight against the corruption used as a weapon uh, for the government or for the party to uh, contain the, the discontent of those uh, leaders uh, who have taken advantage of the during the previous decade of the state control over the economy uh, in China. So in the Xi Jinping reform, the, the key motto is actually uh, giving a decisive role to the market. By the way, it doesn't mean that this will have an impact on the political system, which in the views of the present leadership should remain uh, untouched, but for the fight against corruption. Thank you very much. I actually wanted to ask, uh, but you already answered the follow-up on the on the environment, uh, and uh, thank you for outlining the efforts that the government is making on that. Um, I have one other question. Uh, it's more um, uh, on a global scale. We've talked about Russia. Uh, we talked about China. We talked about the U.S. We talked about the EU. And uh, I wanted to to ask you, how do you see Russia? Uh, playing a role globally, also vis-à-vis -vis China. It's a whole new topic, I know. <laughs> it's a whole new topic, but it's a key topic. It's a key topic because the very existence of Russia, first as a Soviet uh, state and eventually as a Putin-led uh, state, Russia is uh, sometimes preventing Europeans to think that they are also a Eurasian uh, power. Uh, Europe does not belong only to Atlantic. It, it does not belong only to the Mediterranean region. It belongs to Eurasia. And Russia is playing uh, like an uh, uh, obstacle to take full awareness of the potential China and Central Asia represent for Europe. So I believe the coming decades will be uh, decisive to include Russia in a wider Eurasian project, exploiting the possibility opened by the One Belt, One Road on the Chinese side, but also hopefully with uh, EU initiatives by uh, better integration with uh, Russia and Central Asia. I believe uh, this is a formidable uh, strategic challenge for Europe, but we cannot imagine Europe remaining in the present confrontation with Russia. Russia, in a way, belong uh, at least for half of it to Europe and therefore should not be ignored by Europe and should not be taken hostage either by China. So we need to engage with, with Russia, but with a broad Eurasian views. Thank you very much. I think we finished just on time. Uh, I thank you again for your contribution. And I thank you for uh, those uh, who've been following. Um, 
we will now uh, briefly um, talk about uh, the, the program. Professor De Fren, in fact, is a professor and a trainer at our Trade Policy and the TTIP program, which uh, will take place uh, this autumn uh, from 24th to 27th of October. We, um, sorry. We will um, happily welcome him back. Uh, the program is uh, comprehensive uh, and intense. It will start with a general introduction on EU trade and international trade, including, of course, the WTO, which was uh, mentioned um, during the, um, the session earlier. It will also go into the specifics, so we'll look at plurilateral trade agreements as well as bilateral trade agreements, uh, taking examples such as the EU-Canada and the EU-Vietnam FTAs. Um, it will then move on to, of course, uh, focusing on exercises because all the theory that the participants will have acquired needs to be cemented and this is always done through practice. And um, finally, as uh, my director earlier explained, uh, we have extended this course with an extra day and uh, the extra day will focus more globally on uh, specifically the TTIP uh, but also briefly on the TTP and China. Uh, the, it will basically follow on from this webinar. And uh, we will look at uh, the TTIP on a, from a general perspective, look at regulatory cooperation, and also analyze why is the TTIP considered so controversial. So we will be happy to welcome Professor De Frame back for some of these sessions. And um, we also would be happy to welcome you for more information you can go on www.collarope.eu forward slash trade policy. Here you will find all information on registration and uh, all the um, activities that are included in the, in the fee. For more information on all our other courses, because as my director previously mentioned, we have also courses in the summer and many other courses in the autumn, please do not hesitate to go on www.colorop.eu forward slash executive education. We thank you again for your participation today. Thank you for uh, following us. And uh, we really hope to see you uh, in the near future in one of our courses. For any information, please do not hesitate to contact us using the email address info.development at coleurop.eu. Having said this, we, I wish you a very good afternoon and hope to stay in touch. Bye-bye. <laughs>